to the encouragement and building of your people in Jesus name Amen Turn with me if you will to 1 Corinthians chapter 13 1 Corinthians chapter 13 starting at verse 1 Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understanding all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove all mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profits me nothing. Charity suffereth long, and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. It doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil. Rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth, but whether there are prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away foolish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as I am known. And now abideth faith, hope and charity. These three, but the greatest of these is charity. Praise God. Well, here we are at the 13th chapter of Paul's letter to Corinthians, his first letter. And in the previous chapter, chapter 12, Paul had set out these gifts and abilities that were now available through the Holy Spirit to the body of Christ. He goes on to explain how they are for the benefit of the whole body and that they are to glorify the name of God by their right use. However, <clears throat> excuse me. However, Paul's final words in chapter 12 give us a clue as to exactly what this 13th chapter is about, and that being a more excellent way. But what does this phrase actually mean? First, in the Greek, there is a preposition, which is kata. This really denotes intensity in the following word or words. Then we have hyperbole, hyperbole, sorry, hyperbole, which means a throwing beyond others, that is super eminence, um, preeminence, abundance, exceeding far more, more excellent in other words, beyond or out of measure. So then what is it that is above all measure? Over and above all these other gifts that Paul has laid out in chapter 12. Well, that's exactly what we're going to examine today. And to begin with, we're going to look at the matter of love. The matter of love. <clears throat> you know, some years ago, quite a few years ago now, there was once a, a popular song which went, oh, I think you'll probably all recognise who that was. All you need is love. And in a way, that is true. Not for the reasons they sang, obviously, but the big problem is the kind of love that this song referred to is not the same kind of love that the Apostle Paul is talking about in our text. The kind of love referred to here in chapter 13 is agape the Greek word agape love and this is the Greek word used throughout this chapter and indeed 
throughout all the New Testament. Just what is though this agape love and what makes it so special that Paul would take a whole chapter in his letter to the church at Corinth to teach about it? Well, agape itself, the Greek word agape, here in the King James translated as charity, means the following. It means love, that is affection or benevolent love. Uh, it's used for love feasts or feasts of charity. Dear love. The equivalent Hebrew word is ahav. Ahav. Which means to have affection for, sexually or otherwise. To be loved, loved dearly, like a, a dear friend. This is the word we see in the Old Testament where the love for God and the love of God for the righteous are discussed in such places as the following Deuteronomy uh, chapter 6 verses 4 and 5 Deuteronomy chapter 6 verses 4 and 5 say this Hear O Israel the Lord our God is one Lord and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thine soul and with all thy might that word that is Aha. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 12. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 12 says this. For whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth, even as a father, the son in whom he delighteth. For whom the Lord loveth, that's our word, Aha. This kind of love does not come naturally to fallen man. It was there before the fall, but was lost to man through the sin of disobedience at the fall. This kind of love comes from God. It is unconditional love. It is the kind that Jesus himself described in the following scriptures. Scripture, rather. Turn with me to John 15. If you will, verse 13. John chapter 15, verse 13. And verse 13 says this, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. That word love is agape. Greater love hath no man than this, then he'll lay down his life for his friends. However, with this agape love that Jesus is talking about in this wonderful, wonderful scripture, he laid down his life not only for his friends, but for all mankind. He laid down his life for his enemies as well as his friends. That is this agape love. It's unconditional love and that love included not just his friends but also his enemies whom we all were by the way before we repented and came to faith in the Lord Jesus this is the love of God a love which now in Christ compels us to pray for our enemies and to do good to those who despitefully use us it is a love that can only come as a result of a man becoming oneness, achad, with the Lord. In other words, brethren, we must be redeemed by the blood of Christ to, be, to have access to this agape love. Yes, it took the willing sacrifice of his own son, of his own life, sorry, on that cross, of Calvary, thus satisfying the wrath of God, his Heavenly Father, to allow us once again to know that agape love. What an amazing sacrifice that was. What a selfless act that was by the Lord Jesus to bring us again to that place where as before the fall, man could know this 
unconditional love of God. Well, that is agape love. Next, let's turn to love and the gifts. Because Paul here has planted it in such a place as to surround it with the gifts, as it were. So, with this in mind, why would Paul put this chapter all about love in between two chapters, 12 and 14, that teach about the spiritual gifts? Well, we're going to try and answer that question next. Now, in Corinth, as with many other such colonies in the then Roman Empire, paganism abounded. We've had the political background uh, in Corinth in the first of these studies, in the introduction to this first letter to the Corinthian church. So, you should now be aware that there would be many who would use the occult and sexual rites and rituals pervading the time when this letter was written, as well as magic practices to their own advantage, as it were, to make profit, to gain from these um, from these so-called gifts, these magic gifts, these magic rites and rituals that were pervasive throughout this pagan society. Paul indeed met with many such practices in in the various places during his travels and one such account is recorded for us in Acts 16 verse verses 16 to 24 turn with me to that if you will Acts chapter 16 starting at verse 16 Acts 16 verse 16 through to verse 24 Verse 16 says this, And it came to pass as we went to prayer, a certain damsel, possessed with the spirit of divination, met us, which brought her masters much gain, by sooth saying. The same followed Paul and us, and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. And this did she many days. But Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. And when her masters saw that the hope of their gain was gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace unto the rulers and brought them to the magistrates, saying, These men, being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city and teach customs which are us to reserve, being Romans. And the multitude rose up together against them. And the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer who kept them safely, to keep them safely, sorry, who having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. Well, there you are, such... Practices bringing financial gain for these uh, controllers of this demonically controlled damsel. However, once redeemed, once born again and part of the church, the body of Christ, any gifts that were given and endowed by the Holy Spirit to an individual are set out for us in chapter 12 and next time chapter 14 were for the benefit of the whole body of Christ not for an individual person in other words anyone who has a gift by the Holy Spirit should not be looked upon as a celebrity neither should uh, use of a gift be seen as proof that someone is born again it may be a sign or an evidence of salvation, but never proof. You should understand why, after reading what we've just read, this damsel displayed a gift. She understood, she knew, because of the familiar spirits and the demonic activity around her, who and what Paul and his people were. 
and why they were there. But she wasn't born again. She was demonically controlled. That was no proof of salvation. These gifts and abilities can be a sign or an of salvation to the body of Christ. Hence we find Paul's teaching here in chapter 13 about love, agape. Now, as you read the first three verses of this chapter, chapter 13 of our first letter to the Corinthians, you can see that Paul is saying that you can have all the gifts of God bestowed upon you. But if there is no driving force, no um, engine, if you will, of the unconditional agape love present in the believer, as which, of course, can only exist in the cruci crucified life of Christ within the believer, who is fully submitted to the Lord, then they are absolutely useless to the body and to the individual. Let me say that again. You can have all the gifts of the Holy Spirit bestowed upon you, but if there is not within you this unconditional agape love of God, driving these gifts, being the driving force behind these gifts, then they are useless. In effect, this love is the very soul of the character described by Jesus himself in the Beatitudes. And you can find those, as we've talked about many times, in Matthew 5, verses 1 to 16. Let's just look at one or two of them, shall we? Turn with me to Matthew 5, if you will, just for a moment. We'll just read a few of these. Bearing in mind our 13th chapter, talking about the core behind these gifts. The core behind these gifts of the Spirit. Blessed, this is Matthew chapter 5, verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. And it goes on. This, as we have looked at previously in other messages, describe the character of the disposition of Jesus himself. And behind that disposition, the driving force behind all that Jesus did and said was this central fact of agape love, the love of God behind everything that Jesus did and said. And without this agape love, this, all these other gifts and abilities are hollow and empty. In fact, Paul says himself that if we don't have this, this love, then we are but clanging cymbals, a noisy gong to all around us. So in effect, this love is the very soul, as I said, of the character described by Jesus himself in the Beatitude. And I say this because that along with this 13th chapter it really completes the description position. This teaching of the love of God and the spiritual gifts and the outworking of those things that we read in, in Matthew 5 the characteristics of the disposition of Christ, the character of Christ himself, 
This agape love completes that, doesn't it? It makes it whole. It, it's a complete description of who and what Jesus Christ is. And further to his teaching on the excellency and importance of this agape love in the first three verses of chapter 13, Paul goes on to show a further two aspects of it to the believer as follows. We're going to now look at 1 Corinthians 13 verses 4 to 7. In these few verses, Paul describes for us the wonderful influence this love has upon the heart and upon the mind of the believer who allows it to have full sway in this I see the following in these few verses I, I see the following points number one it suffereth long verse four charity or love agape suffereth long turn with me to James chapter 4 James chapter 4 verse 17 James chapter 4 verse 17 Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him is sin It suffereth long it also vaunts. It is not puffed up. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 6 1 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 6 and These things, brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes that you might learn in us not to think of men above which is written that no one of you be puffed up for one against the other and number two love is not unseemly love is not unseemly and that means it is not uncourteous it thinks no evil proverbs chapter 10 verse 12 proverbs Chapter 10, verse 12. Hatred stirreth up strifes, but love covereth all sins. And again, in 1 Peter. 1 Peter, chapter 4, verse 8. First Peter chapter 4 verse 8 And above all things have fervent charity among yourselves for charity shall cover a multitude of sins. That word charity is our word agape. And above all things have fervent love among yourselves for love shall cover a multitude of sins. Number three Love rejoiceth in truth it rejoices in truth rather with truth it rejoices with truth it exalts not in the unrighteousness of others we can back in Genesis 9 Genesis 9 turn with me to that Genesis 9 verses 22 and 23 And Ham, verse 22, And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brethren without. And Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it upon their shoulders and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father. And their faces were backward and they saw not their father's nakedness. They did not rejoice in unrighteousness. They didn't want to see the unclean thing. They didn't want to see the nakedness of their father exposed. Turn with me now to Proverbs 
chapter 17 Proverbs chapter 17 and verse 15 Proverbs 17 verse 15 He that justifieth the wicked and he that condemneth the just even they both are an abomination to the Lord and finally on this point Second John chapter 1 verse 4 2nd John chapter 1 verse 4 I rejoiced greatly that I found of thy children walking in truth as we have received a commandment from the Father walking in truth Paul rejoiced greatly in their godly walk Number four, love beareth all things. It endures without divulging. It bears all things. How many people have been have known attacks, even within the body of Christ, even from their family and so on? And love bears all things. It endures without divulging these things. It doesn't make a big point of them. Turn me to 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 12. It says this, verse 12. If others be partakers of this power over you, are not we rather? Nevertheless, we have not used this power, but suffer all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. Love beareth all things. It endures without divulging. Number five, it believes all things. It is unsuspicious. James chapter 3, verse 17. James chapter 3, verse 17. Love believes all things. Chapter 3, verse 17. But the wisdom that is from above is pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. It's unsuspicious. Number six, it hopeth all things. Or in other words, what is good in another, even when others have no hope. Second Peter chapter three. Second Peter chapter three. And verse 17. You therefore, beloved, seeing you know these things, beware. Beware lest you also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own sin. I think I read the wrong one there. Second Peter 3 verse 9. Sorry, I read the wrong... Yeah. Verse 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. This love has a hope for all things. Hope, our blessed hope, is in Christ Jesus, isn't it? And if we have this love of God, then that hope, that blessed hope, will abide within us when all things around us seem black. And finally on this point, number seven, love endures all things. In other words, persecutions in a patient and loving spirit. Turn with me to Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12. A well-known and beloved scripture this. Hebrews 12, I'm going to read from a few verses from uh, Hebrews 12 here, verse, starting at verse 1. And we're looking at love endures all things. It endures persecutions in a patient and loving spirit. Verse 1 of chapter 12, Hebrews. 
Wherefore, seeing we are also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God, for consider him that endured such a contradiction of sin against Herod and faint in your minds. You have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin, and you have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. And he scourgeth every son whom he receive, receiveth. If you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? Wow. Love endures all things. And our example, our great example, is Christ himself. And now, the final few verses of our chapter 1st Corinthians 13 verses 8 to 13 in these final few verses Paul really teaches us that unlike all of the previous gifts of God that he is described in chapter 12 this agape love once received will continue or endure throughout all eternity not only this wonderful thought but but that it will also be the chief and most glorious element of our eternal existence with him what Paul is telling us brothers and sisters in the church is the same as he was teaching at Corinth it's the exact same as he would tell us if he were here today in this present life we need faith hope and love we need faith hope and love Hebrews 11 as proof texts of this Hebrews 11 verse 6 says this but without faith it is impossible to please him for he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him 1 Peter 1 verse 3 says this blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead a lively hope 1st Peter chapter 1 verse 4 says this to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time 1 John 4 verse 7 beloved let us love one another for love is of God and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God this love described here is agape verse 8 1 John 4 verse 8 he that loveth and knoweth not God sorry he that loveth not knoweth not God for God is love and further down in verse 15 of 1 John 4 says this whomsoever shall confess that Jesus is the son of God God dwelleth in him and he in God 1 John 4 50, 16 sorry and we have known and believed the love that God hath to us God is love and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God and God in him there is now brothers and sisters really little else to say this is but a short chapter but it contains such powerful powerful instruction to us to say about it except that without agape love 
none of the gifts, indeed our very walk with Christ, will not work. And it will certainly never bring glory and honour to our Heavenly Father and to the name of Christ Jesus. This is why Paul so wisely placed this little chapter, this chapter of 13 verses. Between chapters 12 and 14 that teach about the gifts of God. Simply put, brothers and sisters, if we do not have and display agape love in our lives and in our walk, we do not know God. Do you know him today? Seek him. Seek the gifts, yes. But the greatest of these is love. Christ's instruction to us some of his last words to us who believe in him were to love one another. If we love one another, then the world would know and see that God sent him. And he is of God. He is God. Do you know him today? Seek the gifts, yes. But seek this agape love of God over and above all things. God bless you, brothers and sisters.